everyone. Um, we're actually venturing into something new today. Uh, we're doing a, a lecture here at the store as well as we have our um, need, some of the needs customers online that are logged in. So um, you may see things popping up here. It's some people asking questions. And typically how I run this, um, I, I tell people to not hold the questions till the end to ask throughout because there might be some confusion throughout and it's hard for me to go back to the slides that uh, there, there are problems with it. So just ask that throughout. And um, those that are on needs, you can uh, do it through your browser and we will, we will get to your questions. So welcome everyone. My name is Laurel Sterling. I'm the registered dietitian here at Nature Time. And um, it's a free service of the store. We also have um, other healthcare uh, practitioners that work through needs, like Christine Carlson, that, that the needs customers can call into and, and ask questions uh, based on any of this information here or anything else that, that may have questions on. So um, I'm going to get started. So this is about aging through the golden years gracefully. Who doesn't want to do that, right? I know I have uh, a lot of longevity in my family. People are living, uh, grandparents I knew um, into their 90s and great grandparents were, one was 94, one was 99, one was 100. So when people ask me, you know, how long do you shoot for? I said, geez, I'm shooting for into my 90s to 100. So that's my goal. <laughs> and, and healthfully and gracefully as well. Okay. All right. So this is kind of what I was just alluding to. Um, I have a lot of, of PowerPoint uh, slides here in this. So some of them I'm going to go through more extensively. Other ones I'm going to go through kind of quickly. And if you have questions after, you can ask me. Because I want to get in all the information that I can here. So don't, don't all of us want to live as long as we can, as, as healthfully as we can, gracefully, um, waking up without pain, getting through the day energized. And that's a, a lot of our goals here, I believe. Live your life in a way that improves your health. And, and we're all here. I was just reading something today about um, it was alluding to Earth Day and how um, when you look at the Earth from, well, from our standpoint where we are now, it seems sort of segmented and cut up with the, the different states and the nations. But when you're out there looking at the Earth from space, you see it's all united. So uh, what we do affects the next person. What we don't do affects it. And so there's that whole pay it forward, taking care of each other in the Earth. So um, live a life in a way that improves your health. So why do we want to make some of these changes? Well, they've actually seen the National Institute of Health um, saw that they recommended lifestyle changes as the most important and cost-effective way to lower cholesterol. And they saw also that they should use lifestyle changes as a recommendation for first-line therapy for a lot of other things, not just the heart disease issue, but diabetes, which is what DM stands for, cancer, arthritis, osteoporosis, and Alzheimer's. So some of these issues that can creep up with aging, and when, when do we say aging starts? I mean, I've had issues with uh, eye problems starting, well, it actually started in my teens, and it's gotten worse over the years. So I've started to use an eye formula in my 30s. Um, mental issues as far as memory and whatnot, that, that comes all different types of uh, places in our life. Possibly some people... Um, some women after they've had babies, if there's stress associated with the memory loss, um, hormonal balance changes. I, I've seen a lot of that with women going through perimenopause and menopause that, that um, they seem fuzzier, or less focused. So um, things can, it's never too early actually to start some of these. I know a lot of people will start joint um, repairing formulas in their 30s as well. So um, the issues, a lot of them that we see creeping up, uh, gastrointestinal complications, and I go through um, not all of these, but I touch upon quite a few of these throughout. Inflammation, I'll go through a bit of inflammation and joint issues. Bone loss, um, I don't really touch upon this one very much, but that's something that definitely needs to be addressed. Muscle atrophy, hormonal changes, again, these, some of these could each be a PowerPoint into themselves. So um, eye problems, cognitive decline, which I get into, and sleep dilemmas I talk about as well. So where can some of the problems begin? Gastric issues, appetite loss, vitamin D deficiency, these are just some of the beginnings that could possibly be causes. So with the gastric issues, 
gastric atrophy, which is the, there's damage to the stomach cells, whether that's from use, overuse of um, the NICEDs, which is the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, other medications, um, aging, foods, ulcers, whatever the damage may come from. Um, also, hypo and A chloridia, which is low or no gastric secretion. Again, that could be attributed to a lot of just little things. Decreased enzyme production or secretion is very important when we talk about the B12 and, and other um, enzymes that need, and minerals and vitamins that need to be absorbed. Uh, decreased bile production as well. So with the gastric atrophy, it's more likely to occur as we age. And they saw studies show that it occurs at rates range from 30 to 60 percent of adults over 60 years of age. And before worry, the damage actually can be reversible. And they have seen that there is this product called carnosine, which we have here in products called Pepsin, Zinc, Zin, GI, and Zinlorite 75. Um, this is zinc bound to carnosine, and they've seen that this actually helps restore um, the gastric and the esophageal lining. So this is a product that's been studied all over 20 years, 18 18 or more now, different studies used um, extensively over in Japan for a lot of healing um, sense issues related to of, um, people that had Barrett's uh, esophagitis or ulcers, inflammation up and down the esophagus or gastritis, other issues. So it may help those cells to feed appropriate amounts of gastric acid after the treatment. And typically the standard uh, amount of time on this product, the, the bare minimum is about third, they saw two months. Some people actually do it longer, but we have some good results on, um, within that two months. So the hypo, low um, gastric, gastric acid secretion, leads to the malabsorption of B12, which, yeah, which is typically what would happen because with the B12, it is, is happening within different proteins. So it, within the food, and that starts to break it down in the stomach, we need the intrinsic factor, which is secreted from the gastric cells. Down. And this B12 is bound to um, uh, send some, I think it's some, some protein binding uh, molecules. And then that then has to go into the small intestine and be broken down further. So you need so efficient gastric acid, you need sufficient pancreatic enzymes to help break this down further, to help bind it to the intrinsic factor in the small intestines to then have it be absorbed. So it's important that you have, again, enough gastric acid, enough of the pancreatic enzymes. This can lead with the, with the B12 deficiency to fatigue, cognitive decline, um, malabsorption, energy loss, a whole host of other things. Um, also with this uh, low stomach acid, iron deficiency anemia can be and anemia can be possible. Um, again, you need sufficient gastric acid. Also, calcium absorption may be impaired. Supplementation of calcium may not slow or halt bone loss without betaine hydrochloric acid to help. And these are some things I'll talk about in the next couple slides. Also, I want people to know um, with the a lot of tremendous amount of people on acid blockers out there. I know there is a reason for some people. Some have um, ulcers, but this is something that should be used temporarily. It says right on there, no longer than two weeks. Um, some people use it if they have uh, um, hernias or whatnot um, that cause issues that they're constantly getting acid reflux. So. It depends on how to use these things, and it's not something that you should stay on long term. You need to discuss this with your doctor, because I've had people in with that were on these products for 20 plus years, and then they all of a sudden were dealing with issues with um, osteoporosis and a whole host of other malabsorptive issues because different ones block different things in the system from being absorbed. One is folic acid, B12, iron calcium, zinc, so that's dealing with your immune system, the inflammatory with the B12 and the folic acid. So um, this is something you definitely want to speak to your doctor with if you have to stay on that. We also have other options too, which is what we're going to get into with the digestive enzymes and the hydrochloric acid. So decreased enzymes. If enzymes or gastric acid are insufficient, then eating larger meals or just eating food can cause a lot of bloating, gas, and constipation issues. So supplementing with digestive enzymes, which we have a whole variety of them out there. Um, again, I want to say right at the forefront, pertaining to any of these slides forward, anybody that's on medications, you definitely need to check with your healthcare practitioner 
whether it's naturopaths or whether it's um, certified nutritional um, nutritionist or dealing with uh, your um, nurse practitioner, MD, whatnot. You, you need to make sure that these are okay to take with that and um, not having any interactions because certain things, like say when I'm talking about ginkgo biloba, that's also a blood thinner. So if someone is on something like Coumadin or Warfarin, you need to know that um, for them when they're getting their protein checked. So you definitely need to ask your practitioners first. But supplementing with digestive enzymes, there's a variety, like I said, out there, one specifically for um, fruits and vegetables and grains, there are other ones that are a broad spectrum that would cover your proteins, carbs, fats, um, the, the ones with lactase in there to help break down the lactose. There's a whole variety. Betaine hydrochloric acid. This is another one that's um, synthetic made. It's like your stomach acid. Now, I vacillate between trying um, both of these. I don't try to take too many digestive enzymes. I use a little bit more of the betaine hydrochloric acid right now. I use the lower dose one because... Um, you, this one, if you take too much of it, it actually can cause severe um, uh, fire up your throat, really, is what happened for me, is, is really bad heartburn. So you have to be very, very careful with that and um, take one. Everybody's got a different dose of what they need. Sometimes I'll just take one and I find that sufficient. Same thing with the digestive enzymes. I might take one or two, depending on how strong they are. Um, but I don't take them all the time. I just take them as needed when I come across something that I think might actually cause an issue for myself. Um, also, bile acid. We have bile acid factors uh, that can be ordered. I don't think we have that right in the store, um, but that's another product. A Jaro has one that actually helps break down fat. Okay, so anybody that has malabsorption of fat issues, whether there's a gallbladder uh, removed or whatever might be going on. Um, and, and this is something that we can help to direct you towards which one that would probably be the best for you. So using these can help prevent, uh, yes? Okay, so the question was, are there foods, natural foods? Yes, there definitely are natural foods and spices. Um, cinnamon can help uh, with digestion, pineapple, um, onions, these are all things that can help with breaking down. Um, pineapple is one of the bigger ones. And papaya, they all help break down um, proteins. So you could start with the foods for sure and see if those will do it. And if not, actually taking foods out as well. Say, for instance, for me, what bothers me most is gluten. Um, that's one that's very hard to digest. And I find that if I take that out, then I tend to not even need those digestive enzymes or the hydrochloric acid. So good question. Balance it as far as help enhance? Um, right. So that's that's talking about the ones that actually I just... Well, there, yeah, the ones that have natural enzymes in there. There are other herbs and spices, too. I don't know all of them, but um, that's something that I could find out. Like I said, I know one, for instance, is cinnamon that really helps out with digestion, too. Yes, there, yeah, that would be through your doctors. Mm -hmm. And actually, I did this one that was recommended um, to me a long time ago to take, and I wouldn't recommend doing this. You need to talk to someone first but I just sort of did it on my own. I took some uh, hydrochloric acid, a lot of it, through the morning, afternoon, and evening, and they say to take it to the point of when you have really bad heartburn. Then it sort of stimulates the stomach acid, and then you back down. But I'm telling you, that acid that was coming up was for a long time, and it was pretty severe, and I wouldn't recommend that. That has to be monitored. So um, there are tests that the doctors can do, so to check that. Um, Low daily caloric intake also can be triggered by appetite loss, which can increase with age due to, there's a lot of different factors of why there might be appetite loss. Depression may be an issue. It might be dental issues um, as far as not being able to chew the food very well. It might be a, a money issue. Um, so that can lead, also we have taste loss. So contributors of taste loss are zinc deficiency. Again, so if we aren't absorbing it very well from an acid blocker or, or whatnot, so you're going to have a zinc deficiency. Medication side effects, like I was just saying, and chronic diseases can lead to this. 
So there is this product um, that we have by um, two companies that I know of, Metagenics and Thorne. It's um, called Zinc Tally, and it's a test that you can actually do at home. Sometimes we do it here for some of our clients when we have the product here. Um, what you do is if you put a little bit in the cup, the amount that it says is a few ounces, and if the liquid is tasteless, it indicates that basically you might have a zinc deficiency. But if it's a very strong metallic taste in your mouth, that means that your body has enough of it, so you possibly don't need any more of that. So that's how we judge it. Some people that say, oh, I, I minimally have a little bit of a taste, then maybe you need a little bit more zinc. Um, but if you don't taste anything at all, then you really have some sort of a zinc deficiency. Okay. Now I go through each of these different sections, the balanced eating, regular activity, different supplementation, stress management, and sleep throughout. Um, so these are different issues that we need to touch upon that are, that are the basic fundamentals, I think. So meal planning ideas. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides, but I did have these um, put together already, so I wanted to add them in. Basically, if there is an issue with um, eating and there, there is an issue with uh, trying to get in enough nutrients for whatever the reason may be, you want to make sure that they're calorically dense, nutritionally packed, and tasty enough for you. So that can be something like having um, some apple with some almond butter. So that's nutritionally dense with the almond butter there. Or the hard-boiled egg, and then you can have something else with that. Uh, the cottage cheese with some peach slices. So your mixture of combination of protein, carbohydrate, and fats, getting all the macronutrients in there that you need. Again, here's some other ones. So this would be, for example, some breakfast ideas, high protein toast. You could have a Greek yogurt if the yogurt is okay with your stomach. Fresh fruit with that, some chopped nuts and ground flax. Again, if there are no dental issues or digestive issues with the nuts. Um, Obviously, if someone has some diverticulitis issues, I know they usually say to stay away from nuts and seeds and grind it up as much as possible. But that's also a bacterial issue as well. Uh, so meal planning ideas for lunch. Again, these are some basic things. Homemade soups, making sure you're getting some protein and fat. You want to make sure with each meal and snack you're getting a combination of protein, carb, and fat. Okay, Fat sustains, fat helps pull in fat-soluble vitamins. Um, protein is a part of almost all of your cells as well, so it's, in, it's very important that you get in protein and builds up the muscle. Um, and a lot of people, when I hear sort of when they're tipping into the, the, you know, depending on the age, it really doesn't matter, I guess, but some people that just start dropping off, with it, they're going to have just coffee in the morning, and then they might have some toast or crackers in the afternoon. So I find that it's it's eating like a bird, and it's mostly carbohydrates, so they're really not getting in enough of the combined macronutrients from the protein and fats that we need. Yes? Um, some brand names of high-protein crackers. So we have Dr. Crackers crackers. Um, also, Marigon crackers might be some other ones that we have. Um, I definitely know Dr. Crackers is higher in protein. They, they usually put seeds and some other stuff in there. Um, so other dinner ideas, again, these are basics. Um, chicken, wild rice, and salad. You can uh, make your own salmon. Quinoa is very great, and brown rice, they're very high in protein. So you get some more protein from your um, vegetable sources or the uh, grain sources. Sample menu. So a day might look like something like this. Smoothie uh, with fruit, yogurt, and flax for breakfast. Snack, you can have an apple with some nut butter. Lunch would be a salad, making sure you're getting protein, like your sunflower seeds, your chickpeas, feta, turkey. A snack would be pear and some almonds. Dinner could be pasta with seafood and grated cheese with some veggies. And then you can have a little treat of your, you always have to have fruit. Pertaining to what I believe, a little bit of dark chocolate, you know, is, does the body good, I think. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so lifestyle exercise. There's a lot of things that we should be doing. Um, I was just talking to a client the other day. He said, uh, well, I'm, very, I'm retired, but I'm very active. I'm constantly on the go doing stuff, um, repairing this, doing that. Well, that's great. But honestly, if you had to look at a food pyramid, for um, an exercise pyramid, uh, you would really want to have those basic things on the bottom. And then from there, we really need to add in 
the um, doing some strength training and some extra aerobic activity because I asked him, I said, are you out there getting your heart rate up for at least a, a sustained 30 minutes? And he said, well, no. And and he had put on some weight too. So I said, well, you really need to start looking at that piece, whether it's walking. And, and again, when it comes to an exercise plan, you have to be very careful um, if there are any health diagnoses or um, any issues like it was cardiovascular rehab. You have to be very careful and work with the PTs or um, the exercise physiologists that would be getting you back into that um, slowly. Same thing as I have a woman that got out of it because she injured her um, ankle slipping on some black ice. And so she actually was out of commission for a while and she liked to do Zumba. And so I said, well, um, you have to listen to your PT and do what they said. So she could do the recumbent bike, but she couldn't go out there doing um, a lot of the walking. Walking she started to do just a little bit at a time. So you have to work within the limits of, of what you have. And you want to start in there slowly, gradually, and then work your way up to your own pace. And it also has to be something that you like. So if someone told me that the only way that I could get to go out there and, and swim every because um, I, had, I was a lifeguard girl like to swim to get to that certification. Yeah, I really didn't like swimming to get that. And so I had the job over and I knew how to do all my strokes and swim and we um, every week. But to do cycling and running, uh, so you have to do, if it's indoor tapes, tapes I think Leslie Sansone or whatever her name is, that I have a lot of people that they like that. There's classes. We sit down and think, what do I like? Outside. Do I, I like to be outside? Do I, do I want to be in a group setting? What would, what would make me keep doing this? And that's what you need to really focus on. Um, so this basically I went over. You know, the, there's a lot of benefits for exercise. The uh, circulatory system, the limb system gets that going. The rebounder, one of those little mini trampolines is great for getting the, the limb system going. I didn't know, I thought any exercise would stimulate um, the muscle limp, but apparently that you need to have the anti-gravity things that would help for, for your limb system. So that would be like the, the rebounder. Um, helps out with the muscles, keeping your muscles stronger because a lot of your immune system is held in your muscles. So people, we see them going to the hospitals, muscle wasting starts to happen, the atrophy, the, the immune system starts to drop, okay? That's very important to keep up the muscular structure. Your bones helps out with the bones. So when you're doing strength training, what's happening is, is that after age 30, they said that you're not really building any more bone. What your body's doing is those osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. The osteoblasts lay down the outer all throughout, and the class eat the old, okay? So what happens is, is those blasts stop building and the class continue to eat away the old uh, bone structure. So in order to continue to put new and lay down new bone structure, what you have to do is have some sort of stressor put on that bone, which is, again, your strength training. It would stress it and it would signal to the brain, oh, there's a stressor, we need to protect. So then it starts laying down the osteoblast to help with um, increasing the bone mass. So that's why strength training is important too. And hormonal balancing. We all know, I don't know if anybody has been at all in any kind of a bad mood and then when they, 10 minutes into whatever they were doing, working out, that it is all has just disappeared. I've had that happen to me many times before. It's great, it's almost like a therapy for me when, when I go out for, when I used to go out for my runs. So um, it's, it's very important to help out with, with hormonal balancing. So do something that you like and try to make it as much as you can throughout the week, at least four times throughout the week. Now this leads me into arthritis, okay? I'm going to get a little bit more onto this arthritis um, issue because I know that's, that's um, something that is a bigger concern as we start to enter into with the aging process. Um, arthritis is inflammation of the joints, characterized by inflammation, pain, swelling, redness. Most common forms are osteoarthritis and rheumatoid. I'm not going to be going over rheumatoid. I'm going to be focusing mostly on osteoarthritis, which is the deterioration of the cartilage that cushions the ends of the bones. The bone ends up moving against the, the bone, so it's bone on bone, causing a lot of pain. 
Um, try not to let it get to that point. I saw my poor father who is a farmer and he just kind of let it go where his, they said um, his hip uh, and the socket were almost fused because it was like these shards of bone on bone. And once he had his hip replacement, he was golden after that. So don't let it go that long. Um, a, and also it's a building up of synovial fluid in the joint causing swelling and inflammation. So symptoms are intermittent pain, the audible creaking, which I have in my knee, but they said it wasn't they said it wasn't arthritis, it was just the cartilage had broken down in there. Um swelling, inflammation, restricted movement, um causes again, age related, normal wear and tear, genetic and also injuries can speed that up. So what is inflammation? It's an infection. It's also arthritis. It's also linked into cancer, heart disease, diabetes, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, Alzheimer's, psoriasis, eczema, a whole host of other things that you might not think are linked to inflammation, but they are. So it's very important that we look at inflammation and what the causes of this are. So chronic inflammation begins at the cellular level. It's often due to free radicals. Okay, and many factors can produce these free radicals. Free radicals basically are um, in the body. What they do is uh, when you're looking at the cellular structure, you have the, um, the atoms in there with the neutrons, electrons. And what these do is these free radicals coming from wherever, like the smoking, pollution, acidic foods, the sunlight, saturated fat, stress. What they do is they try to rob the healthy cells from their um, outer, I think it's the outer electrons, and they pull it away. And basically what it's creating is a, an imbalance and a crusting, a sort of rusting of your cells is what it's basically doing. So you want to limit any of these exposures, and there's ways that we can help to decrease any of this damage. So through a combination of diet, lifestyle, and dietary supplements, we can reduce the damage caused by this inflammation. So some of the um, triggers are injuries, allergies, and infection. These can cause inflammation in the body systemically. Other contributors to inflammation, overweight. So the weight puts a lot of um, pressure on the joints, which increases pain. The standard American SAD diet, okay, that's the one with a lot of white processed fast foods. And I know none of you in here and online have that, right? <laughs> um, so the types of fats, high in omega-6s. Um, this is something that I, that I learned when I was doing the lecture on raw. I was looking at the raw diets, and people that had switched over to 100% raw diets did it because they had a lot of health issues, felt better. But then all of a sudden, 15, 20 years into it, they started feeling like, oh, the skin is... Um, rough and dry and we're having all these other issues and they started looking at oh we're eating a ton of nuts and a ton of seeds that are very 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 high in omega-6s which are very very inflammatory okay omega-6s some are anti-inflammatory some are inflammatory but it was very pro-inflammatory they weren't getting enough of greens and other things to offset those omega-6s so they had to rebalance it and they started to pull themselves out of the 100% of raw and going more into the maybe 80 or 90% raw because they needed to add in some cooked foods and some greens. So also food allergies and intolerances can cause inflammation because the body is overreacting. There's something in there that the body says, I don't know what this is, I don't like it, I want to get rid of it. So it sends up the inflammatory marker. So what you can do when you have these issues with the food allergies, um, it's recommended to eliminate from your diet, you know, I don't know if about that two months is, is really feasible. What uh, Doris Rapp, who is one of the top allergists, and she's more of an integrative allergist now, she actually said that if you take an item out, say if it's uh, wheat or if you want to take out gluten or dairy, whichever you choose first, take it out for a full week, completely out. And then on the eighth day, for breakfast, you have whatever it is. Say you're going to add back some dairy, so you're going to have some cereal. And then for lunch, say you're going to have some cheese. And dinner, have something else that's going to be like cottage cheese. And then throughout, see how you do. Um, and then you give yourself also the two days at least after because you may have a lag in your response. So it may be something like all of a sudden you're getting headaches. You're noticing um, when you didn't have it out. Um, you may be getting sinus drippage. You may be getting more pain and inflammation in your joints. 
there's all different reactions that you can have. Um, there may be fogginess. Uh, you can't concentrate as much when you've added that in. So there's a lot of reasons why you could try just taking these out. And then you would, if you find that you do have that reaction, then fine. You keep that out, and then you move into your next week and you choose another, whether it's citrus, you keep that out, and then on the eighth day you add it in throughout the day. So that's a good way um, of seeing. I've done this myself, and I've only done it on three days, not seven days, and I have seen a huge difference when I've added them back in. So you can try that. So there's um, refined sugar, gluten, dairy, citrus, and nightshade veggies, which I'll go over those in a minute. Um, so what can we do for this? One of the things that we can do is alkalizing, okay? An acidic environment in your body um, even mildly acidic can cause inflammation. Now, your, your stomach has to be very acidic to try to break apart the molecules that we need to then be absorbed in the small intestine optimally. But the rest of the body, you really want to have the blood more of um, a slightly neutral to pH, uh, neutral to um, alkaline. So check your pH levels. You can do it with the test strips. We have them here. Um, you can do it with your saliva or urine and keep track of it. It's recommended you do it in the morning with your urine. Um, now, what does pH mean? pH stands for potential of hydrogen. It's the measuring of the acidity or alkalinity of a solution, and the scale goes between 0 and 14. So 7 is neutral. The lower the number from 7 down is acidic. The higher the number, it's more alkaline. As well as I mentioned, the pH of all tissues and fluids in the body, except the stomach, is slightly alkaline, just a little bit over 7. I see a lot of people coming in with it, 5, 5.6. Um, so what can we do? Definitely avoid as much as possible your hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated oils. This is, these are the trans fats. Um, the artificial colors, flavors, sweeteners, preservatives, hormones in meat and dairy, limiting white refined sugar and flour, which basically is white refined sugar when it's broken down in the body, limiting alcohol and uh, caffeine as well. So if you are acidic, you can definitely do a few things with just foods alone. You can increase your vegetables, um, almonds, apple cider vinegar, lemon. Lemon is a great one. You can add that to your water or you can add it onto your salad. A lot of people I know have, have started doing this traditional uh, hot lemon water in the morning. It also helps with lemon detoxify the liver. So it's doing a whole host of things. Yes. I'm not sure why the warm, I don't know if that was more of the... Um, looking at the Ayurvedic and the, the cooling, if it's too cool, then there's the, um, the not, well, not digesting very well, so warm, you know, moderate to warm. Um, well, when you look at the charts, I think the almonds are on the um, alkaline side. But there again, from now what I've learned from the... Uh, raw, that almonds actually are pretty high with uh, the omega-6s. Ones that were actually lower are walnuts. I think they were the lowest with the omega-6s and higher in omega-3s. So I'm not saying not to have these, but let's think balance. This is it. You know, some people just go way off to the right kilter, and they just throw themselves off. Like with these diets that are the paleo, very high protein, I'm, the Atkins, all the offshoots from that. You know, you can do these healthily, but you have to make sure you've got in a lot of your greens and other things to balance. Whereas I see people coming in more and more. I've had two um, men in their 60s that threw themselves into acidity, and they had um, they had uh, um, what's that? They had um, stones actually from it. well, gout probably would be another one. Yeah, but I saw kidney stones. Um, so. They didn't have them prior, they did have them right after. So you have to be very, very careful with that. Green tea is another one too, very alkalizing. And across the board, green tea um, helps out with, um, with uh, the detoxifying in the liver, as well as they're seeing it in a, a whole host of different studies with cancer protective. She just had a question. Yeah, the difference is, yeah, Black tea is actually different than there are benefits within there, but the green tea specifically with the EGCGs that are found in there are the that's the health component specific to the green teas. Yes. I don't no, I don't think so. Right. I don't think that that 
nothing that changes that at all. Yeah, I think the EGCGs are still left within that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, there are supplements to help out with the acidity. We do have um, trace minerals that's very alkalizing. You can add those into your water. Now, they do taste sort of sea-like, so you want to start out with very small amounts, like maybe seven drops in your water, um, in the, about an eight-ounce water. They say you can work up to 40, but even if you get in 20 or so a day, that's good. There's also... Um, I can't think of the exact names of them, but there's some pH balancers out there, other alkali, Alkamax drops that we have too. I had one woman that did seven drops a day of that, and she said that that is what kicked her over when she couldn't actually do it through the foods very well. So um, there are the pills, drops, um, minerals, like I said, there are um, uh, magnesium, things like that, that will help with the alkalizing. So that's where you would definitely want to focus on more of your, your greens that are very high in the omega-3s, okay? And, and dress with fish oils and um, dietary, like I was saying, uh, you can look at chia seeds, hemp seeds, the walnuts, they were actually um, lower, lowest in the omega-6 and higher in omega-3s to so offset that. And the greens, very high in the omega-3s. Okay. So juice is recommended for arthritis. Um, there, not everybody's going to be juicing, but I thought I would throw this in there. Um, some good ones, uh, cucumber, carrot, fennel, kale is great across the board for a lot of things. Um, you have turnip greens and turnips and wheatgrass is another one that's, um, I have a juicing book and that one is almost in all the different ailments, uh, wheatgrasses, so that's a great one too. And if you don't want to juice it, we have powders here as well. There are a lot of greens powders. Greens, that's another thing, too, that I forgot to mention is um, green peas can alkalize. Greens powders that we have, if you want to add that into a smoothie or your own drink. I actually drink this one, um, trace mineral berry greens, and it's very alkalizing. So that's, that's just easy. I put it right into my water, and it tastes great. So that's another easy way. Um, antioxidants. These will defeat the free radicals that are formed. Um, they're responsible for preventing that oxidative stress on the body. So these come from a lot of things like your cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, kale, cabbage, cauliflower, um, Brussels sprouts, all in that family. They also help detoxify the liver too. Um, others, as I already mentioned, green tea. Then we have all these other newer, but I don't know as if these are new. Now there's even more beyond the acai, goji, mangosteen, noni. These are all different ones that are out there in combination or by themselves in capsules, powders. You can add them to drinks. Um, there are liquids out there too. Depends on what you prefer and what you're going to actually stick with. There are certain things that I will stick with, certain things that I will want in liquid, certain things I will want in capsules. So you've got to find that, like anything, what, what's going to work for you. So you may need more. You may not be able to get the benefits of this alkalizing and reducing the inflammation through the foods. It's, you may need to look at certain supplements. And I'm just going to touch upon probably about five or six of them. Essential fatty acids, these, like from fish oil, inhibit arachidonic acid, which increases inflammation in the whole entire inflammatory cascade. Also, high lignin flax oil is another choice if you didn't want to go towards the fish oil if you were looking for a vegetarian or vegan option. A borage oil, too, is, it contains high amounts of GLA, which is called gamma linoleic acid, and that actually leads down throughout the anti-inflammatory cascade. That's one that we use also if someone has uh, psoriasis, other skin issues, too. That's a very good one. Um, I also have a good friend that has rheumatoid arthritis, and she used high amounts of borage oil, um, amongst other things, for her anti-inflammatory. So celadrin. This is an acidified fatty acid that comes in a pill and a cream form. I've actually used the cream. The studies are, are very, very good when they looked at this over uh, 60 days. They looked at it with animals and they did all these different, well, they did this one specific human study where they were looking at elbows and knees and motility and pain reduction. And they found that it, it worked very well. But 
even in combination with the cream as well as the supplement, that it worked really well and enhanced it. I only use the cream myself, and I did find that it, that it worked well. It has a cooling effect um, because I think it has some sort of eucalyptus or whatnot. Did you have a question? It just depends on certain things. Like, for instance, this is in a sterified form. Um, there's also things like, um, I'm going to be talking, I don't know if it's the next slide, but Mariva is, um, it's this uh, one right here, which is um, a curcumin form that's bound to phosphatidylcholine that actually helps pull it into the cells more efficiently. So it really depends on the form of it, and um, I would check on that. And if you ever have any doubt, you can either come in and ask us, and we can look into it. I do have people ask me things, as well as you could call needs, too. But it varies depending on the fillers, the binders, things like that. It, it really varies. Like when people would ask me what's better with liquid, pill, or capsule, I would say, listen, I'd have to look at the product, what actually um, forms these vitamins and minerals are coming in and actually what other fillers and binders are, are in there to make a really educated you know, answer for that. So I'm going to just go backwards. Sorry about that. So Genical is another one. This is um, one that we pulled into the store I think about a year ago. And this one's really interesting. This is a, a collagen um, product. It's actually from um, bovine, hydro, hydrolyzed bovine collagen. And the composition of cartilage, 1% of it is glucosamine. The rest of it, well, a big chunk of it, the 67%, is collagen. Um, so this actually helps out with rebuilding the collagen. So using something like this along with the glucosamine chondroitin would be uh, a great option, or along with the, even a, just a glucosamine. Um, minerals, also with the Genical, they said it was very anti-inflammatory as well. Minerals magnesium, it's a mineral that is used in over 325 different enzymatic processes in the body. Very deficient in our soils. This is, as I said earlier, very alkalizing. It relaxes all smooth muscles, does so many other things. There's a book called Magnesium Miracle by Dr. Carolyn Dean. Um, and in there, it's just the information is um, tremendous about the different studies relating to magnesium and its importance. We have it in pill form, you have it in powder, we have magnesium plus ionic fizz, trace minerals research, again, I touched upon these already. Um, they have them all in combination. Again, it'll vary just depending on what you are going to stick to. Some people say they would rather do the pill, some people would rather do the drink, whatever works for them. Mm -hmm. Right. So if the fish oil repeats on you, it could be a variety of different things. One, when you're taking it, it should be taken with a meal with some sort of a fat in there to help out with the digestion. Two, with the fish oils that you're buying, you know, say you just grab something off the drugstore shelf, you don't know the quality and the heating process, whereas we actually have some top-notch companies that are even doctor-recommended, like Nordic Naturals and, and Carlson, that are very good quality. Um, and even still, if you're having issues with, with burping it up, um, there are enteric coated ones, ones that have this special coating that it bypasses the stomach, opens up in the intestines, and actually the absorption rate of it is much higher because it's not broken down by stomach acid. So you can take less of it, getting a higher benefit of it, and you don't have that burp back too. Yes? Right. It works with no, so that was a, a chaser of coconut oil with the fish oil and then there's no burp back or is it just a flavor? Because she uses, oh I'm sure. Well good. Well, see, there you go. That's, you know, stimulating the fat, hopefully helping with the digestion. 
Thank you. So Zeismund is another one. This is a very, very popular product that we sell um, a lot of here. It's, it's a very supercritical concentrated extract of a bunch of different oils of turmeric, ginger, oregano, green tea, holy basil, rosemary, and skullcap. And these are all used in different ways to target the inflammation going on in the body. If you need to rebuild the cartilage, if there is that issue, you wouldn't just take something, even natural or otherwise, to mask that because you're going to continue to do the further damage. So you want to take things that are going to repair as well as then take care of the inflammation. Okay? And this deals with any kind of systemic inflammation. And I already touched upon the Mariva. This is a highly bioavailable curcumin extract, um, which is a powerful antioxidant found in turmeric. Cayenne, there's a cool cayenne, boswellia, that blocks the synthesis of leukotrienes, which is, again, in the inflammatory cascade. Cat's claw, these are some of the newer ones that I actually haven't used too much, but I've been reading. Yes. Yes. No, it, yes, no, it definitely will have an effect. I actually put it on my dog's food as well. It, it's going, any of those are going to have an effect for sure. Yeah, even that little amount. Um, depending on, again, how severe things are. If you're coming in with c trying to come off of some very powerful um, anti-inflammatories, is that little amount going to cover it? Probably not. You're probably going to need a few things to try to offset that um, and do it more naturally. So you're going to need things that are pulled in very strong and more powerful. But any of that stuff is going to be a benefit for sure. Yeah, oh, I do too. Uh, I do too. Um, so cat's claw, found to stimulate the immune system. It does relax the smooth muscles and it dilates blood vessels. It's a diuretic and antioxidant. And it's used in some of these studies for um, osteoarthritis as well as rheumatoid to reduce pain and inflammation. And it is in some formulations. Devil's Claw, I don't know as if we have it out there. I was looking and it might be in a tincture. But um, this one they've seen is possibly effective for decreasing pain with osteoarthritis. And they said some people taking Devil's Claw seem to be able to lower the dose of their NSAIDs they need for pain relief with the hip and the uh, knee in particular. So they reduce their amounts, which is good, because that can have an ill effect on the stomach and lead to stomach bleeds and ulcers with too much. And I've had people have that as well, using other um, pain products that they've uh, overused because they weren't told that they didn't have to worry about that and it affected the, the GI tract or the brain. Uh, so back pain, taking devil's claw orally seems to lessen low back pain as well. Now here we were talking about the enzymes, okay, proteolytic enzymes breaking down proteins. So if you take them with your meals, as you were asking earlier, with different foods that can help break down um, you know, versus taking digestive enzymes. These could be taken with your meals and it would just digest your food. But in this sense of what I'm talking about here is you take it away from the foods in between the meals so it attacks the inflammation in the body. Okay, the proteins that go out into the body and, it, and attach and start creating more inflammation. These taken in between meals will attack, attack those. But if you take it with a the meal, then it's going to be a, a very expensive digestive enzyme, basically. Um, so bromelain, it's a proteolytic enzyme derived from pineapple. Studies have shown that bromelain inhibits the pro-inflammatory prostaglandins while also increasing the favorable ones, so it's a good balancer. Quercetin is a potent flavonoid found in onions and apples and other veggies. This was also found to help mediate inflammation. And Wolbenzyme M is a clinically backed product that contains plant-based enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, as well as antioxidants. And in some of these, too, you need, again, you need to speak to us or a healthcare practitioner to find the correct doses on these. Some, some people actually, for pain and inflammation, take upwards to 9, 10, 12 of the Wolbenzyme um, to get a really good benefit on that. So it, it's going to vary person to person. Again, you have to make sure that it's okay with certain medications for any of these. Yes. What do you mean as far as the... Not all of them, no. Um, so glucosamine and chondroitin, I talked a little bit about this. 
Glucosamine is a substance naturally found in the joints, made from glucose and glutamine. It can help rebuild the cartilage in the joints. So this, along with that other product, the Genicol, would possibly be very beneficial together. There are vegan forms, too. Chondroitin um, is important for the creation of cartilage as well. Um, it attracts the water into the pro uh, proteoglycans um, in the joint, usually found from shark or cow, and that can thin the blood. And with any of these, too, like I said, you have to check because any of these can cause, just because they're natural, doesn't mean there wouldn't be some sort of contraindication, depending on meds and whatnot. Yeah. Right, and then they were initially not knowing if chondroitin was, was absorbed very well because of the size of the molecules, so they've come out with different forms of it now. Um, so, yes, mm -hmm. some people choose to not have it. Some have it with MSM, which helps out with the anti-inflammatory. So there's a lot of different variations out there. Uh, multivitamins and minerals, why do we need these basic ones? Well, we live in a different world than our grandparents hundred or so years ago, the soils are very different. They're not, um, the crops aren't rota rotated like they usually should be. There's all these huge farms out there. You just see these monocultures. Did anybody come and see that movie Fresh that we aired? Yeah, so it's, it's creating all these monocultures which are also enhancing stripping of the soils and um, creating these superbugs as far as bacteria as well. So we don't want that. We want to try to do the, the rotation of the crops. And organic farmers typically do that. They know that. Uh, so again, there's a lot of different vitamins out there. There are whole food, raw ones. If you have a great, great diet and you're juicing all the time, do you need to take one? Possibly not. But if you don't think that you're getting everything throughout the day, which I know I don't, I just take this as my basic as a coverage. Um, so there are specific ones for men and women. There are ones that are one a day six a days, there are ones that are for 40 or 50 and older, a uh, different variety of ones that we could help you focus on which would be the best for you. Again, essential fatty acids are another crucial, very important thing to have in our diet. They're the main structural component of every cell membrane. They help with lubricating joints, easing PMS, hormonal balances, lowering triglycerides and cholesterol, reducing blood pressure, they're anti-inflammatory, as well as helping out with the uh, moods, vision, learning, different types out there. Okay, so the omega-3s are typically the ones that we are most efficient in as far as our diet. We get five, six, and seven, nine throughout our diet. So what we need to do is balance those. So you would get your omega-3s from fish, flax. Uh, you could get some from, well, the other forms, not all, all of these have threes, but uh, chia seeds do, krill does. Uh, you just want to balance. And how you would pick which ones you would need would depend on what health issues you, you are going on, and we would direct you towards the specific ones. Probiotics. These are very crucial. Um, there was a study done by a Japanese man in 1977, and it's still referred back to today. Um, it was a very prominent study showing that when they looked at people who were losing their beneficial bacteria in the lower GI tract, so in the upper um, intestines is the lactobacillus family, and in the lower colon, it's the bifidobacteria family. So they saw from age 50 beyond that when the natural aging process with the bacteria that just starts naturally dropping off in the colon, they found there was a rise in this putrogenic bacteria, which was not beneficial. So the body wants to balance itself, right? Something's gone, we can replace it and fill it in with something else, whether it's fibrous tissue or non-beneficial bacteria. So with this rise in this putrogenic bacteria that comes in from foods and byproducts, they also found a rise going right along with that in colon cancer. So it's very important that you get a combination of some sort of bifidobacteria in your probiotic. So if you get it, you get it naturally from um, things like um, your foods like yogurt and kefir, kombucha and sauerkraut, if you're regularly having cultured foods, um, but you also really need to make sure that you're getting in that bifid rich bacteria. Very, very important. This is a lot of our immune system, over 80% of it or so, is housed in our GI tract. So things will diminish the good bacteria in there, so, such as drugs, fluoridated, chlorinated water, pesticides, stress, drugs. 
white flour, too much sugar. This all feeds the, the non-beneficial bacteria, the um, from fungals that are in there as well, and it creates this imbalance in the GI tract. So it's very important that we balance in that and repopulate with the beneficial bacteria to help out it with our immune system. Also, as I said, it doesn't just do that so bad. It helps detect by harmful estrogens. Helps metabolize cholesterol. Aid in the production of serotonin, our happy hormone, which is great. Helps out also, as we typically know, for diarrhea and constipation. Great. So there's a lot of strains that I could said. There's the lactobacillus, which are human. Human strains actually they get in there and implant. They exert their benefits, right? And then they, they, they actually help out a lot of the other bacteria, too. The dairy and soil, they, they go in, they do their benefit, and they are transient. They move on. Okay, so and we want to have some of the human strains in there as well, ah, from the, the bifidobacteria. And then there's also other ones as well. So you can get shelf-stable ones. There are the pearls. There are ones in the refrigerator. The amounts vary. Again, that's where we can help you guide it. There are certain ones that are for um, the, if there's yeast infection, so repopulating the vaginal flora. There are certain ones that are very high. Their numbers like 100 or 200 billion. If someone's just been on an antibiotic and they were having issues, or if someone has C diff, so um, we will specify which ones depending on the problem. Vitamin D deficiency. Um, there's a higher risk of D deficiency with age due to malabsorption of this fat soluble vitamin. And pretty much here, most people are going to be vitamin D deficient. I think it should actually be as a regular on the labs now instead of me having to tell people, so what is your vitamin D level? And they'll say, well, I don't know. I don't think I've ever had it checked. Or, oh, it was like in the 18s, or it was 6, or I've had one that was non-existent, which is horrible because it's been labeled as a neurohormone. So it's very important to help out with so many different issues within the body. Um, it can cause poor immunity, inflammation, osteopenia, and porosis because it's helping pull in your calcium. Um, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Like I said, with a neurohormone, receptors exist in the cognitive areas in the brain, and it has a role of some sort protecting the brain and the nervous system. They, so they've seen very low levels, and I'm talking lower than sometimes 30 or 40, which you would think, oh, that's normal, that's in the normal range. 30 to 100 is normal. But when we were looking at some studies associated with low levels of vitamin D below 55, they saw all these different diseases like cancers and MS and um, breaks, falls, fractures, heart attacks in men increasing. So an optimal level that you should try to strive for is probably like 55 to 70, somewhere in there to keep it up. And you have to make sure that it is taken with food because it's fat soluble. They found that people that their levels weren't going up, well, they said, well, let's try to have them take it with some food. They did. and 68% of them had their levels go up from that point when they couldn't increase it. So typical amounts during the summer if you're not out a lot because it won't transfer through the um, sunscreen. Uh, it won't, you know, hit, you have to have no sunscreen basically for it to be absorbed and hit the cells and the cholesterol in the liver, kidneys, and whatnot to be processed into the D3 form. So if you're out there, say, 15, 20 minutes, three times a week, you're going to get a significant amount, which is good. But if you don't, and you don't want to go out, you know, 1,000 um, international units throughout the summer would be good, and in the winter, a minimum of 2,000. Now, if you're sick, your body sometimes uses up to four or 5,000. So there's been times where I've had maybe a week or 10 days where I've taken about 10,000, and then I've backed it down after that to maybe, say, um, two, three, four thousand, depending. Um, you also don't want to stay on high amounts for a long time. One guy came in and he had been to see someone and they had him on five thousand and he just never stopped. His level got to a hundred or above, and that can be toxic because it is stored in the liver, so you have to be careful. So, cognitive decline. Um, vitamin D3. One study looked at the vitamin D3 levels in 100 Parkinson's patients and 100 Alzheimer's and 100 healthy people over age 65 and found that the healthy group had a 16% higher vitamin D level than the two other groups. Um, CoQ10, very important. We have all sorts of formulas out there, or you can do individuals. Again, depending on if someone has a heart issue, I would say, great, CoQ10, 
very powerful antioxidant found in the cells and in the brain and your muscles. And that's very protective as far as um, antioxidant helping out with energy production, cellular energy. What's that? So how much, like a basic amount, if you don't have any other cardiovascular issues, I would say just basic bare minimum is about 30 to 60. But if you're on some sort of blood pressure product or uh, medication or cholesterol medication, they actually do block the CoQ10, CoQ10 production. And naturally, CoQ10 decreases as we age as well. So you want to make sure at that point you're on at least 100 milligrams of that. And there's a lot of different forms of the ubiquinol, ubiquinones, and, and we can discuss those with you too. Um, alpha lipoic acid, again, an antioxidant, helps protect, protect the neurons, actually helps increase glutathione um, in the liver, which is a very powerful antioxidant that our body makes. Crosses the blood-brain barrier, um, helps out with diabetes, diabetic neuropathy, helps with the pancreas, so there's a lot of things, um, a lot of benefits. They're actually calling Alzheimer's, possibly dementia, but more Alzheimer's, the diabetes of the brain. Okay, they're seeing people, a correlation with people with diabetes, which is sort of crusting of your cells, right, with the brain as well. These are the latest studies that they're seeing. So um, what's going on in the gut is what's going on in the brain as well as the rest of the body. If there's inflammation in the gut, inflammation in the brain. Ginkgo biloba enhances the blood flow to the brain. Again, this one is a blood thinner too, so um, you have to be careful with this one. Uh, DHA, this is what's coming from your fish oil, helps out with enhancing the memory, focus, learning. Uh, acetyl L-carnitine, it's a precursor to acetylcholine, which is that's um, helping with the nerves transmit from nerve to nerve impulses. Uh, there's also DMAE, phosphatidylcholine, and phosphatidylserine. These are, um, phosphatidylcholine is basically part of the cell membrane, so this helps you can find it in things like lecithin and egg yolks and whatnot. Um, we have it as, as supplements too. So this helps um, with, with the cognition as well. Methyl B12 and 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is a specific folic acid, they actually help out with the anti-inflammatory. Again, they're, they're associating strokes and heart disease along with the inflammation of the brain too. So this decreases systemic inflammation. Certain medications block your B, as I talked about before, the stomach uh, lowering ones, um, the acid blockers, decrease your methyl B12 and your um, folic acid. Um, GPC, which is like a choline, uh, lion's mane, which actually is a mushroom that it actually helps to um, increase the myelination, which all of your nerves are encoded with a myelin sheath. And say for MS, what it is is the breaking down of that myelin sheath so nerves can't contract uh, or actually um, transmit from nerve to nerve to nerve so muscles start deteriorating. And this actually helps out with uh, remyelinization. Bacopa, vimpocetine. Um, bacopa is an herb that's been used, out, that's been used um, in Ayurveda for helping out with memory, cognition. Vimpocetine is an extract from the periwinkle family. Again, that's been used in uh, a variety of different things, again, for cognition, yes. Yes, that's actually, they've seen that, that that is something that it does. Mm -hmm. The Huperzine A, that is one that um, you got to be careful with. It actually works like some of the uh, Alzheimer's dementia medications. So you have to be very careful if, you're, if someone is on that, then you probably cannot be on the, the Huperzine A. Specific supplements for women. Again, I've gone over the multivitamin, essential fatty acid, probiotic, and then after that, it's as needed. If there's hormone support I need to work with you on, bone health, um, it just kind of goes from there. Specific supplements for men, a multivitamin, EFA again, probiotic, those are the basics, as needed after that. Prostate issues, testosterone issues, whatever they're dealing with. Now, detoxification is very important for everyone. As I was saying, how important the gut connection is with the brain, that's very crucial. And we all have um, different free radicals and a lot of toxins in our body. The majority of the toxic substances 
are fat soluble and they have an affinity for and stored in high fat tissues. Um, so they're not actually excreted very well. So it's important for many functions in the body as far as cognitive inflammation and eliminating the free radicals. So doing a detox, again, making sure that it's okay with medications and whatnot is something that you can do. Um, I can go through that with you, and, and you can do it simply with foods, which I'll talk about, or there are kits, a lot of other things um, that you can do. Toxins are everywhere. Heavy metals, liver, microbial, breaking down of our natural body's process when we're breaking down foods can create microbial ones, uh, metabolic ones, and there can also be microbial imbalances that cause problems. Heavy metals, actually they've seen a lot of issues with heavy metals with Alzheimer's and dementia too. So you can do some sort of a heavy metal detox. Simply eating, one of my favorite things that I just fell in love with last year, cilantro binds heavy metals. So that's a, that's a great one to add into your salads or to juice with. Um, so this just shows you a little bit about the liver and the detox process. Toxin comes in. Enzymes act upon it. They try to make it more water-soluble to excrete out of the body. So this intermediate stance in there can be very, very toxic if the body doesn't continue on with the process of packaging it out and getting it out of the body. This, this is very important because it filters two quarts of blood every minute, and it's from everything we breathe in, we eat, we are putting on our skin. And babies now, they're seeing, um, it was an article that they had from... 2012, I believe, they took the cord blood and examined it, and they found babies were born with over 200 different chemicals or more within them. So it's stored in us, and then it just continues as a buildup from each generation, unless we start to break the process and, and cleanse ourselves and eating healthier, exposing ourselves to less of those toxins. So as you'll see how important it is with this phase one, there's a lot of those B vitamins, B2, 3, B6, folic acid, B12. There's your glutathione, am amino acids are there, uh, flavonoids from your uh, fruits and vegetables, the phospholipids we've been talking about. And then in the phase two, you see a lot of, the majority of the ones over there, glutathione, glycine, taurine. Those are mainly the amino acids. N-acetylcysteine helps free up uh, glutathione to recirculate and grab more of those toxins and excrete them out. So it's very important that we get those through our diet, and if not, then you can have it through supplementation. So foods for detoxification, we already mentioned earlier, the cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cabbage, bok choy, arugula, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, um, limonene-containing foods, oranges, tangerine, lemon, not the grapefruit because that actually can cycle medications through quicker. There are certain ones that will say not to have with grapefruit. Um, so heed that warning for sure. And if someone actually has a thyroid issue too, there are some, um, I'm not sure where the stance is on this now, but they used to say not really to have too many of the raw cruciferous ones because they contain goitrogens that um, bind up the the iodine and can decrease the, the thyroid's ability. So cooking it inactivates those goitrogens, so um, having those moderately. Foods and spices to support detox, such as your B vitamins, which we went through, curcumin found in turmeric. Actually, there are three um, specific ones, the rosemary, turmeric, and green tea. What I found out about those is in the liver, um, there is glutathione. And there is an enzyme, um, no, actually, it's, yeah, glutathione and beta-glucuronidase, I believe, is what it is. And actually, if there's a lot of toxins coming in, and you can have a lot of toxins, but if you don't have enough of this enzyme to bind those two together to excrete those toxins out, then you're just going to have a buildup of those toxins. They're not going to get excreted out. So... Uh, the things that increase that beta-glucuronidase enzyme to bind is the rosemary, turmeric, and green tea. Yes? No, yeah, they would, they would have cooked as well. Um, obviously, when you cook things, you do decrease any kind of um, enzyme activity or proteins that are... That's why the whole raw started out, because it's live enzyme. 
So if you can have a combination of cooked and raw, but not always on some of these, because I can't have onions that are raw. It'll just create fire up my throat. <laughs> so um, I have to have it cooked. Same thing with garlic. Um, and beets across the board are great for um, helping out with uh, the liver. I actually had one client who told me her aunt was told she's, she's not going to live because her liver was failing. And what she did is she started taking in a tremendous amount of beets and cured herself. She lived for another 20, 25 years or so. So beets are very important for, for the liver, for detoxing. What's that? Right. Mm -hmm. um, also, I already touched upon rosemary and green tea. The milk thistle is one, just one of the supplements. There's, as I mentioned, there's N-acetylcysteine, folic acid, other things that help out with the whole detox support. Um, process. And good old water, having good quality water helps out with detoxifying. Um, it helps prevent muscle and joint pain, bloating and constipation. It helps prevent headaches. It helps maintain your healthy skin. Additional types of cleansing. There's fire infrared saunas that some people use, Epsom salt baths, detox foot baths. Again, check with a healthcare practitioner before you do these to make sure it's okay for your health. Stress cascade. We, stress is a big problem at any age. There actually is a whole hormonal cascade that's going on in the body, and it starts with hypothalamus in the brain signals pituitary, which increases the production of hypoadrenal cortisotropic hormone, which is the ACTH hormone. That signals to release the stress hormone cortisol and cortisone. And actually, these to inhibit white blood cells and suppress the immune system. In this entire process, if it's kept going on for a long time, long term, months to years of this constant stress, um, it initiates a pro-inflammatory cascade of events. And this response triggers the body to excrete more amino acids and minerals and electrolytes, and the body becomes so deficient that it just can't keep up with itself. And this is where we see chronic fatigue, sometimes fibromyalgia, we're coming down the pike from this. What can we do? There's a lot of different activities you, you can do. If you like to listen to music, going for a walk, meditating, deep breathing. Uh, there's also other things like chiropractic, massage, tai chi, acupressure, acupuncture, reflexology, and there's supplements. Um, a high quality vitamin would be a start, and then from there, the B vitamins. Your body uses a tremendous amount of B vitamins when you're stressed out. Um, and really specifically pentothenic acid is one of the bigger ones too. So a good quality, well balanced, um, B complex would be a good thing to start with. And that you would take typically, if you took your multi in the morning, you would take that B complex, take most likely in the um, morning, early afternoon. We already talked about magnesium and how important that was. So that's another one that, that would, we would use. And that one I find works very well sometimes just by itself. Yes. Right, magnesium, typically what I do is I start with people taking magnesium in the evening because it also helps out with sleeping and relaxation of all muscles. So I tell people to start at nighttime, and then if your bowels can tolerate another dose of it, then we would have you take some more power during the morning, yes. Now, you can take it without food, but I have found, like I can take it without food and it doesn't bother my stomach, but I have had some clients say it bothers their stomach, so they take it then with a little bit of food. There are, oh, if, what's that? If you had like, um, it doesn't have to be, yeah, it doesn't matter, just a little something um, in your stomach. There are the drinks also that some people like. The, they'll have a little bit of that um, ionic fizz before bedtime and find that that works well for them whatever works best for you. There are some medications, too, that I have looked up. I can't remember all of them, some of them being blood pressure related. It's beneficial that you take magnesium, but they also say take it about two hours away from it because it can interact with it in a good way. It will lower the, the need for the medication, but you have to be careful to take it a couple hours away. Yeah. And K, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It depends. If you're looking for something as bone building, you would definitely want magnesium, calcium, D, K, strontium, boron, all that to help with pulling it into the body. 
uh, the calcium. Um, but if you're looking specifically for, if I, ha I ask people as it, on my questionnaire, how is your stress level? How's your sleep? How do your bowels move? Um, and there's another one, four of them. Usually, if they answer, there's issues with all of them. Then I usually go towards something like magnesium to start out with, and just magnesium. Or in the ionic phys, there's some other things in there too to help with some B vitamins and other minerals. So vitamin C, your body uses up a voracious amount of vitamin C when you're stressed. So um, adding in extra vitamin C definitely beneficial. Other options, theanine. Um, these are, again, the first few that I mentioned, the Bs, the C, magnesium, those would be your basics. Then after that, I would go towards something like any one of these, depending on what's going on with this person. So theanine is an extract found from green tea. And actually, you could have it with a cup of decaffeinated green tea to help enhance the effects before bedtime. It helps with the alpha theta waves in the brain for the calming effect. You can take it throughout the day. There's no drowsy effect on it whatsoever. Phosphatidylserine, I mentioned this in phosphatidylcholine before. It's a natural phospholipid, essential part of our um, cell membrane. It protects against stress. And actually, I found out about the fact that it decreases stress levels when a, a customer came in with a script written for looking for phosphatidylserine because they were specifically telling them to take it to decrease their cortisol levels. I said, wow, I never even thought of that or knew that. So I'm always learning, too, from, from all of you as well. So I appreciate that. Adaptogens. These actually work in the body um, in a wonderful way. The way that these plants grow is they can actually help, they can actually thrive in environments that are very harsh, very severe, different temperature, climate changes thrown at them. So it does the same thing in our body. Basically what I say is adaptogens balance is what they do. They balance. So there's singles, or you could take these, any of these in combination formulas. Typically, they're labeled under adrenal formulas to help with our adrenal glands for the stress. Ashwagandha, it's an Ayurvedic herb, um, helps out with normalizing the stress levels, acts as a sedative and nerve tonic. Holy basil, this is one of the ones that I love, helps lower cortisol and regulates blood sugar levels. I've seen very good results with holy basil, as well as rhodiola. This is another one that um, I know is one of Carol's favorites. It helps normalize cortisol levels and other stress hormones. And maca is a newer one now that um, we've been using. It actually is used for women that have PMS, perimenopause, menopause issues. It helps with balancing estrogen, progesterone, as well as thyroid hormones. Um, it contains a high amount of minerals, vitamin Bs, enzymes, and other amino acids. So that, that one, usually about 1,500 milligrams is a typical dose to start with, but it can have some gastric issues. I did have one woman that started out with that amount, and it bothered her stomach, so we dropped her down to about 500. Um, so some people it does it. It just depends. It varies from person to person. Relora is another one. This is a blend of magnolia and philodendron. And they started using this for the anti-anxiety effect, but they also found that it helped out with sleep. And anybody that was a stress eater, it helped decrease their cravings. Passion flower is working like GABA, has a GABA-like effect, and is useful for nervousness and insomnia. Licorice, you have to be careful with this because if you have any kind of blood pressure issues or on blood pressure meds, this can increase it. So um, this isn't for everyone, but it contains um, constituents that boost the cortisol and cortisone balance throughout the body. Also, there are some homeopathics that work very well for people. Some, I have to start out with that because they react to a lot of things. So this is um, a simple way to start that's, that's usually very gentle. Um, the sleep connection. National Institute of Health reports that 50 to 70 uh, million Americans are affected by some kind of sleep disorder. And if you don't sleep well, you don't feel well, you don't eat well, typically, so a lot of sleep disorders have been linked to many chronic diseases, such as hypertension, heart disease, stroke, depression, diabetes, and many more. So there are a lot of natural sleep aids. Again, this would go back to what's going on. Is it related to stress? Is it related to the fact that you're getting up and urinating a lot? Is it, is it related to the fact that um, your mind just won't shut down? Is it related to hot flashes throughout the night waking you? Whatever it may be, if it's pain, 
this is how I would target and choose which product specifically, and also based on what medications you may or may not be on. Magnesium is one of the great ones to start with. Melatonin. After age 60, they say we pretty much don't have very much of the melatonin left, so it's, it is a good choice to try with supplementation with that. Some it works well for, some not. Some get groggy in the morning from it. Uh, it's just kind of like a trial and error. Gabacom, that's one of the ones that I use. That's for if the brain is overfiring and you can't just shut down that brain from thinking and thinking about lists and whatnot. This one is um, an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so it quiets the brain down, so it allows you to go to sleep. Typically, you take it about an hour before bed, and you can also take it if you wake up. You can also, it's a sublingual, so you just let it dissolve under the tongue. It's kind of a big one, so you end up chewing it, and it's set on the label. It's okay to chew it as well. Um, but I find that it takes... I remember I was in New York City and I thought, geez, this isn't working. And before I knew it, I was out. But it took a good half hour to an hour as I was laying there. And then I used it the second night and I did the same thing. So, um, and for me to be out completely is not normal because I'm one of those who just hears everything. And I was in New York City with a roommate, so um, I didn't hear anything. I, I mean, it depends on, I think I went to bed probably about... 11 or 12 and woke up probably about 7-ish or so. So it was a good chunk and typically I I don't sleep in chunks like that. So it was it was pretty nice. Tranquil Sleep, that's another one with theanine, a 5-HTP which helps out with the melatonin production and um, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the melatonin. Um, and also it has melatonin in there. So that one is a good one that I've had good feedback on. has worked for some. Sound Sleep is one that has a lot of different uh, herbs in there. That one you can only use very short term because of the kava, the valerian, and whatnot in there. I've used that, and that one was another one that knocked me out. Um, but, again, you can't use it long term, on occasion only. Sleep Tonight, that's one dealing with stressors, with, so it targets with ashwagandha, theanine, magnolia, and the phosphatidylserine. Lavella. This is a specifically clinically studied uh, lavender extract that we that they used it initially for women with anxiety in, in perimenopause and menopause, and they found that it worked very well. It went head to head with I don't know if it was lorazepam or what, and it worked equally on that. So it also helps out with sleeping. That's not one that I've tried, but that um, I've seen great great results in research on that. And there's the revitalizing sleep formula. That's another one dealing with stressors. Um, in there. So this is where I got some of the information. Um, our lovely Dr. Jen Morganti, who is our uh, needs education director, as well as some of the Metagenic slides from some of the um, from that company that that I've pulled some of the information. Okay, so this is just some of my information. If anybody needs any kind of uh, consultations or assistance, we also have. Um, Christine Carlson, it needs to, you can call in. If you speak to a customer service rep, they will direct you more towards Christine to answer questions. So thank you for attending. Yes, I could put the phone number up. Okay, thank you. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so are there any questions from you or from anybody else off the web that we didn't answer? Or are we good? Good. Okay. Anybody else? I know I went through a lot of. Yes, go ahead. I know. I'm sorry about that. I have a lot to say in a little time sometimes. <laughs> the meals, yes. Yes. I can hand that out to you if you wanted that. Specifically, I could print those out for you. Right. Okay, okay. You could see me after and I could print those out for you. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's, that's interesting. This whole winter I was craving some of the, uh, um, well, a specific juice that had higher amounts of the um, 
cilantro, and then also um, one of our Amy's meals that had a lot of curry in there, and, and some of the Amy's soups that had curry in there. So, yes, that would be a good. If they're not having any problems, they don't. One of the typical things that we would go towards is if they were having issues with pain and fat absorption and fatty, fatty stools, um, then you would go towards something like a product we have called Lipo uh, Gold that you would take with meals. Or there's another product called BioSalt by Jaro. Again, that's the one that you would use uh, to help out with the fat emulsification. But that's only if you are having issues, not um, not possibly needed if if you're not. Yes. Yes, they do tape them, and then they are on YouTube. But I don't know the lag time with how long before it's it's aired. <laughs> Well, there you go. You could do that, too. Oh, okay. So I can print it for you. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Good. Yes, the YouTube is, there's a click linked right on there. Mm -hmm. And it lists all different talks on there. And you'll see the, the name of it, and then you can click on that. Anything else? Right. Yeah, well, thank you. Okay, thank you for coming.